Welcome back everyone, this is Dave from Cormorant Productions with my co-host Stacy here to talk the movie Vibarium, the 2019 movie starring Jesse Eisenberg and Imogen Poots. The movie's description reads as follows. A young couple looking for the perfect home find themselves trapped in a mysterious labyrinth-like neighborhood of identical houses. The movie was written by Garrett Stanley and Lonergan, Lonergan Finnegan and directed by Lonergan Finnegan. These two seem to work together pretty regularly. Uh, Finnegan has 10 directorial credits, nothing else that I recognize. Before going any further, I'll tell you a couple of things. One, this is not a spoiler-free podcast, so if you haven't watched the movie, I highly recommend you go and check it out, and then come back and give us a listen. Secondly, if you're on one of the platforms that this podcast is now available on, please follow, and feel free to check out my YouTube channel, Corn Productions, where additional content can be discovered. And yeah. Uh, if you're already on my YouTube channel, please like, share, and comment, and subscribe to our channel. Alright, so we're doing something a little different this week. Uh, usually we cover, like, television series. Yeah, you know, we, we do call this a deep dive TV podcast. Yes, um, and yeah, we, you know, we do, like, a couple of, couple of different shows, uh, both of which are on hiatus now. Pretty much almost everything is because of the actor strike and such and such. Uh, but this is very similar to a show that we regularly watch in From. Mm -hmm. uh, which is why, because this is in our wheelhouse, that we decided to cover this yeah. movie. Yeah, so in all of the Facebook groups that we regular that talk about that show and other science fiction shows and, and things like that, um, Vivarian keeps coming up on people's recommendation lists, right? And it's easy to see the parallels here. Um, Absolutely. I actually had watched this movie before. And I, think, I did as well. Yeah, you did as well. And we decided to add this to our list of things to cover. Um, right out of the gate, I'll just say... I don't love this movie. Hmm. Um, I'm not coming at this from a place of, wow, this is an amazing movie. Everybody should watch it. Well, here's <laughs> the thing. I, I'm kind of conflicted here. Uh, or as my feelings about this movie are kind of complicated. Yeah. In the fact that I think that it definitely has artistic merit. Yeah. I think it's a movie you should see because I think it's a, it's a worthwhile movie to check out. But at the same time, I'm like you. I don't necessarily love the movie. Yeah. Mostly because it, it's a feel bad movie. It's like you watch it and like at the end, yeah. you like, you know, I, I don't necessarily like characters. I don't necessarily like movies where all the characters die. Yeah. Spoiler alert. We're talking oh, about the yes. movie. If you yes. haven't watched it yet, yes. I don't know if you said that part I did, yet. I did say the spoiler okay. warning. So, <laughs> so yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody dies. <laughs> I mean, not everybody. There, there's like one or two survivors at the end of the film. Um, like, well, there's the kid. Kid grows up. I and... mean, all of the human characters die. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, not 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 the uh, not Gemma's students. They all live, as far as we know. That's true. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Actually, looking at okay, so I watched this movie once before, and like I said, didn't love it. We decided to cover it because it's something people keep talking about in mm. in our circles of things that we talk about. And um, we said, yeah, there's a lot of mirrors here between this and the show from. And, um, you know, we should watch it again. I thought, I really went into this, like, feeling like maybe I'll enjoy it more now. That I know where it goes. Right. I don't know if I did. No? I still was just like, what the frick? Like, okay, conceptually, I love the story. Mm -hmm. Right? I, I, I should love this movie. I want to love this movie. But, I don't know. It's just something in the execution that just Falls leaves, flat for you. It leaves me, like, not satisfied. <laughs> Gotcha. And I can't pinpoint exactly what. And like yeah, you said, it, it is like, it is, there is some great stuff here, like artistically, mm. visually, it's, it's good. I mean, like, it's creepy to look at. That's the point. Right. Um, I feel like all the actors did a great job. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Um, the acting's great. It's just, all in all, there's just something about the execution of this story that... Doesn't feel it, satisfying. There's something missing for me. Yeah. I mean, it seems to be like a metaphor for, you know... Life, you know, you start off as this happy couple, you buy a home, yeah. you end up with a kid that constantly imitates you, and you perform, perform pointless labor, and then you die. Yeah. Basically. There's there's a lot of, of metaphorical stuff in this movie, mm -hmm. a lot of things that are kind of left open to interpretation. It's not really a direct, here's what happened kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And actually taking these notes about, like, let's talk about what happened in this movie, I found it really hard during some parts of it, like, to even describe what I'm looking at. <laughs> right, right. I mean, like, yeah, I mean, we're we're not doing a detailed scene-by-scene -scene analysis this time. We're going to go through it, uh, but it's definitely not going to be, like, every single scene. Yeah, like because usual. 
I mean, there's a lot of stuff where there's nothing is happening. There's a lot of repetitive scenes. There's a lot of weirdness. Mm -hmm. I mean, I did kind of take, like, here's everything that happened notes just so I can follow along and remember where we're at. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, that's not necessarily... It's going to be a little different than when we talk about a TV show. Um... But, yeah, so do you want to just... Yeah, I need a hug after watching this movie the first time. <laughs> like, it just made me feel bad. Like, just really depressed afterwards. Like, uh, but it's not definitely... It's definitely not a movie that I'm going to rush out to see ever, ever again after this podcast, that's for sure. But uh, do you want to just get into it? Uh, sure. And then we can just kind of talk about all that stuff as, as it comes up. All right. So the film begins with imagery of a cuckoo bird, which I didn't understand this imagery at first, so I had to go and look it up. Okay. And apparently this is an invasive species of bird mm -hmm. that goes to various nests of uh, different species of birds and makes those birds take care of their young. Yeah, so they leave their eggs in other nests and then when they hatch, the cuckoo bird kicks the smaller birds out of the nest, which is what we see at the beginning of this movie, mm. and then kind of just forces the parents to take care of the cuckoo. Which is sort of a metaphor for what happens right. later like in that's, this movie. Sort that's, of. Sort of. Not, not on the surface, metaphor. what's happening in this movie right. is uh, a, a species is making another species raise its kids, mm -hmm. basically. Uh, we cut to Gemma, played by Imogen Poots, who also was in another movie with Jesse Eisenberg that came out the same year, The Art of the Defense. Uh, he, she has 47 acting credits for her, including Green Room with Patrick Stewart and the late Anton Yelchin. And here she's a kindergartner teacher and making them pretend to be trees. They're pretending to be trees and um, they're, they're pretending to be trees and they're feeling the wind, which is actually mm. something that comes up later right, in right. the story. Like a lot of this stuff in the beginning feels like really like, oh, this is just set up. It's not important. But then when you really dig into it, it's mm. like, oh, everything that happened in that opening sequence comes back in some way. Right. Um so yeah, she, she's at the end of the day and she's leaving school and that's the last we'll see of the students or... Well, not quite yet. Well, uh, yeah. We do end up talking to one of them. Right. Uh, who has discovered the fallen babies uh, that have, are victims of the cuckoo bird. And uh, she ends up asking, why doesn't the uh, bird make their own nest? And um, Gemma is just like, that's just nature. And the little girl says, I don't like nature. Yep. And that's the... That's the movie, folks. Yep, yep. <laughs> That's the summary of the whole movie. Right, right there. Right there, basically. <laughs> uh, the little girl leaves, and we are introduced to Jesse Eisenberg's character, Tom, who was in a tree for some reason. Uh, I, I don't he know. He was like cutting. The, so he works at the school as well. Okay, I, I was gather. not really clear about that. Yeah, but. um, he's like a groundskeeper okay. or something. So. And that's a setup that's important to why we end up with a bunch of tools in their car, mm -hmm. right? So there's a bunch of tools that he's puts in the car after his day of... He was, like, chopping the branches, trimming back the tree or something. She even accused him of being the one knocking the birds out. And he was like, of course it wasn't me. I'm a professional. Right. Um. So, yeah, he's got a lot of tools and a ladder. Mm -hmm. And when I saw the ladder, I was like, okay, why is the ladder propped up against the tree during school? Like, this seems really weird and unsafe. But... The whole point was to, you know, show, here's why we have a ladder with us and a bunch right, of tools. Right. Yeah, we're justifying this for later. And he's trying, he's pretending to be a tree, uh, much like the kids were earlier on. I didn't understand, uh, I mean, I'm sure it's connected somehow to this movie, but do you have an explanation for that? Why we're having all these tree metaphors um, in the, at the beginning? I don't know, but, yeah. but, but there's one overlap with, with from. Right, okay, yeah, Tree, yep, Trees true. are important. <laughs> yep. Uh, so he gives a... Baby birds, a proper burial, and a funeral. And Eisenberg, by the way, has 50 credits to his name, including Batman v Superman as Lex Luthor, Adventureland, Zombieland 1 and 2, those are personal favorites of mine, and The Social Network. He played Mark Zuckerberg in that movie. He also has three producing credits, including being an executive producer on this film. So this must have been an important film for him. Uh, this must have been like a passion project for him. We cut to the young couple... Uh, showing up at the office of Martin, who's there to sell them a home in their housing community, Yonder. Okay, so Martin is played by Jonathan Aris, who has 103 acting credits. And it's funny, because I don't recognize this guy at all. Like, <laughs> And he's been in things that I've watched, like he was in The Martian. Uh, he was also in a couple of projects with Hugh Laurie, the star of House. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah, that's that's notable, is this is yeah. like a British show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, because you see... Uh, Gemma driving on the right. opposite side. So yeah. Yeah, that's, that's that's notable. And uh, yeah, he, Jonathan Harris was in The Night Manager, which was a miniseries with Hugh Worry, And uh, his latest series, Avenue 5, which I found interesting. 
So Martin acts super weird during um, the scene. This whole scene's really weird. Yeah. This whole office is really weird. Mm -hmm. If I walked into this office... I would walk right the hell out. Yeah, I would not be entertaining the possibility of buying a house from this guy. I think your husband would. <laughs> we were talking about that earlier. Um, So the office is in this puke green color, which is yes, the color we're going to see for the entire rest of the movie. It's not a great color, that's for sure. Um, and puke green is an uh, apt description <laughs> for that color. And there's eight identical home models lining mm. the walls, which is weird in and of itself because if you're going to show models, you're going to show one. Mm. And then if there's differences between the models, you're going to show more. Right. You're not going to show eight identical floor models in your right. office. Mm -hmm. So that was weird in and of itself. And, um, yeah, like you said, he's he was just super weird. He he described Yonder as a ooh, tranquil and practical housing development. He wouldn't even tell them where it is. Right. They're like, where is this place? He goes, it's it's not too far and not mm. too close. It's, you know, right where it belongs. <laughs> um, and then he's like, let's go look at a house. Right, and he uses a pure of loss sales technique. He's basically like, Oh, you know, you might want to snap this house up now because pretty soon they're yeah, going to be gone. They're going quick, he says, yep. which, you know. I found that kind of amusing. Um, and uh, Tom's reluctant to go. He's kind of like, oh, well, no, we don't have a car. And Gemma's like, no, it can't hurt to look. Right, right. So they're arguing right from the start about this. They're mm. not on the same page before we even get there. Right. Uh, so they agree to follow him up, and, you know, basically Tom describes him as a creepy motherfucker that's also, yeah. you know, very persuasive. And I think that's definitely true. And also, uh, notable as we do compare this to the things we talk about, uh, characters named Martin and Tom. Ah, yep, yep. Uh, you know, we, we know those names. Mm -hmm. Um, alright, so, they follow him up, and we hear, we see a sign that reads, You're home right now. Quality homes forever yeah now at first this sign can be read as welcoming uh as you you know go through the movie right. it reads more like a yeah. threat your home right now is in right you're here you yeah. can't leave you're forever. done this billboard is uh their version of the fallen tree mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and once um, you see it you're done and if you notice on the billboard there, there's a family posed for a portrait they're standing in front of house number nine mm. I didn't even notice yep, that. Yep, house number nine is on the billboard. And by the way, in my notes, I described the, the houses as puke green. <laughs> Just thought I should mention that. Uh, as they drive, neither Tom nor Jenna look thrilled. They arrive at uh, no, house number nine. Martin shows them around and continues to act very strange. And the house is strange itself. Right, yeah. Besides the fact that there's, you know, dozens of houses that are all exactly identical and there's nobody else here... Um, and they are puke green and really <laughs> creepy looking. Um, you get to this house. It's decorated. There's a portrait of the house on the yes, wall. I, I, I would appreciate that art for sure. Um, there's strawberries and champagne in the refrigerator. And he's like, here, it's your welcome gift. Even though they haven't officially agreed yeah, to like, buy the okay, house. Okay, I used to work in property management. I used to show apartments. You don't just feed people strawberries and champagne for looking at a model. No? No, the whole thing's really weird. What do you do when you show a house? You show it to them. <laughs> oh, okay. So you don't give them any wine or strawberries or anything? I mean, like maybe that. for an open house that a lot of people are coming to, gotcha. but not a private showing. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, they're, they're shown this nursery, which is blue for a boy, and, mm -hmm. and they tell Martin they don't have any kids yet, and it's the first time we get this like really weird mocking thing. Right, right, right. Where so he Martin imitates them. imitates them and is like, literally repeats the phrase kind of in their boy it's like really creepy mm -hmm. right like like you should leave now yeah this is a bit of foreshadowing for sure. um yeah and they already want to leave at this they point. already want to leave they're just humoring this right guy. and then um they go to the master bedroom there's pjs laid out his and hers pjs laid out on the the foot of the bed like okay that's not something you should see in a model home right right <laughs> Um, and so then they're shown to the backyard, but Martin doesn't follow them. Right. Uh, Gemma turns or, turns to ask a question, and yeah. he's gone. He's gone. He left. He went, he said bye bye. And Tom is okay with that uh, because it means they can get the hell out of there. Yeah. So they they show themselves out. Martin's car's gone. They get in their car and start driving. And they keep finding themselves back at house number nine. Yeah. They're driving in circles. 
And Tom, Tom basically insists on getting into the driver's seat, thinking that it might change right. something. Right, so yeah, they continue fighting. Yeah, and now they're fighting it's even gotta more. It's got to be her driving is the right. reason they're yeah. stuck in this housing complex. Right. Uh, their, their nerves are frayed. They're getting more snippy with each other. They're looking at their phones, which, of course, doesn't have any signal. Right. This is kind of the stuff that Brom kind of skipped over. I mean, it, 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 it did. It, it did a little, little bit. It, like, it gave pilot. it a short shift in yeah. the pilot. Uh, but here it's like elaborating on that. Right. So they're, they're driving around in circles all day, basically. Mm -hmm. Day turns into night and they run out of gas <laughs> in front of number nine. Yep. Out of all of these houses. <laughs> so now they have to spend the night. And they go in, Tom eats a strawberry and realizes it has no taste. Uh, in the morning, they, they, so they sleep here. In the morning, Tom climbs up onto a ladder that he has in his car, I guess. He brought yeah, that with him. it was on top of the car. Mm -hmm. And all he sees is endless houses. He suggests that they follow the sun, still trying to get out of there. Right, so, so we can't drive the streets. So right. instead of driving around these streets, which are for some reason, bringing them in a circle. They figure if we walk in a straight line, we're going to cut through the yards. We're going to do whatever it takes to go straight, follow the sun, and it's it's got to lead us out of here, right? right. Uh, the day so, keeps going. Yeah, they do that. They, they're no climbing fires. fences forever. It becomes dark again. And finally, they, they come upon a house with a light on, and they're like, yeah, there's a light. Somebody's here. And it's house number nine. <laughs> right. So they're right back where they started. Except this time, there's a box of supplies waiting for them. Yes, in the which front has a of bunch the house, of, there's yeah. a box. Food and toiletries are mm -hmm. in the box. Mm -hmm. So they've been supplied food out of nowhere. And is that freeze-dried shrimp in there? It was, yeah, it was like food that was, it didn't look good. No, nothing <laughs> I would enjoy eating. Uh, so Tom uses the box as a means to set the house on fire. Yeah, he, I, I feel like... At this point, this was a pretty extreme thing to do. He literally yeah. sets the house on fire. Yeah. And that felt weird to me. Mm. Like, I get you're trapped here, but do you want to be trapped here with a fire? Right, right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could easily just burn down the entire hate neighborhood and now you have no place to live. Yeah. And then you still can't. On live. that note, this is something yeah. that bothered me with this movie. Okay. They never once go in a different house. Yeah, that's true. Now, if this was me, the first thing I'd do after realizing we really are stuck here is I'd start exploring the other houses. Mm -hmm. Look for other supplies. Right. Look for other clues. Um, you know, maybe there's a phone in one of them that right. works. Right, right. Now, and maybe the door is locked, but then you could just break in. But they never try even tried. Yeah. Everything that happens in the movie, everything that happens in this house, they continue to stay in this house that they were told to stay in. Mm -hmm. I'd want to stay in a different house just once you realize that this is something evil happening to me, I would do it just to not be where they want you to be. Right. Out of spite. Maybe. Yeah. Just, just, <laughs> but they never once step foot in another house. That's interesting. I, yeah. I didn't think about that. Yeah. So that was weird to me that they just, they settled for, we live in house number nine. <laughs> so, uh, Tom Gum comes out of the house, which is now on fire and tells Gemma that Gemma that he's sending out a smoke signal. Yeah, and they fall asleep on the curb. Yes. Um, they're kind of half sitting up, half laying on each other, and then it cuts to morning. They're in the exact same position. They spent all night curled up on the curb. And they're covered in ash. Covered in ash and soot. Now, why didn't they go in the car? I don't know. Or, you know, one of the other houses. Right, right. They uh, but at least go in your car. Why you literally spent the night sitting on the curb? That's, again, weird. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so they end up seeing another box, and this one has a baby in it with yeah. a message that reads, raise a child and get released. Which, you know, you could take to mean, as they do, that if you raise this child, you'll be set free. Right. But that's not what it means at all. Um, yeah, so there's another insidious meaning here that uh, we will eventually... Yeah, so, so they have a baby now. Mm-hmm. Uh, how convenient, because they yes. have that nursery. And yep. they look up, and the house that had burned down... It is perfectly fine. It's been completely restored, and mm. house number nine is just sitting there waiting for them. Right. And, oh, by the way, the baby is a boy. It's a boy! In case you wanted to know. Uh, of course it is, because right. they have a blue nursery. Right, yeah. yeah. Uh, I guess uh, that's one way to do a baby reveal ceremony. <laughs> uh, anyway, so we cut to an unspecified time later. Now... Initially, when I saw this, I thought that no time had passed. That the boy was just uh, growing up really fast. Okay. I still think that. I don't think, like, five years have gone. Well, they tell us how much time has passed. Did they? Yeah. Okay. So, the next scene we cut to, we start by seeing uh, the roof. 
mm. and they've put the word right. help on the roof. Yep. So we know they're they're actively trying to still look for a way out, but at the same time, they're doing what they were told and they're raising this child. Mm. But there's no longer a baby. We now see a several year old boy. He's probably five. I was guessing five. Um, so we, we see Gemma and Tom wake up in bed and he's at the foot of the bed and he's screaming and they flip him off. Yes. Now he flips them off in return and he kind of like fills us in on what we've missed since the last scene. Yeah. Basically he imitates past arguments. Right. He does the had. whole imitation thing and he tells us this argument. So we hear all this dialogue that has happened between Tom and Jenna off screen. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's creepy. Yes. Super, super creepy. Yeah. The boy does not talk in the boy's voice. That's clear. Mm -hmm. He's talking like with this weird, like, yeah, older... he has different voices for the yeah. different characters that he's mimicking. Mm -hmm. And um, we find out that, you know, in the interim, they fought about trying to leave. They, uh, Gemma's having a really hard time of this. Um, and yeah, they basically just fill us in on what's going on. And we get the idea that they're really unhappy. I would be too. They really resent this kid. I would also. They've learned in this time this is not just a baby they're raising. Right. Um, and then he says, measure me, measure me. He insists on it. So they go and they measure him and she writes on his height, day 98. Oh, okay. So I totally missed that. Yeah. So it's 98 So it's days. been like three months, basically. Right. If not a little bit more. Yeah. Okay, so that makes sense. Yeah, I so I definitely got the sense that this was not like five years later or no, anything like no. that. Even but without they, noticing They kind that. of wanted you to think that, right. I think, at first. Right. When they're like, oh, look, the boy grew up. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's been 98 days, and they're over it at this point. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't even have lasted and, that long. And um, so the, the boy keeps, you know, trying to call Gemma his mother, and she refuses. I am not your mother. We have that theme throughout the rest of the movie. Mm -hmm. They eat breakfast, um, which... He, he starts screaming to, you know, get his food the right way. Yeah. Uh, I would not have lasted three months with this situation. I would have murdered that kid. Yeah. For sure. 100%. And um, you, we, we also have learned that all of the food here has mm. no flavor, just like those strawberries did. So the food is keeping them alive. Right, basically. But it has no flavor, no substance. Just providing them nutrients, really. Yeah. Um, it's, it's fake food. Mm -hmm. that looks like real food right but at, at this point why are you even bothering making different things because it's all the same right why are you all just eating the cereal why are you bothering baking eggs and sausage <laughs> i don't know <laughs> maybe just for the feeling of normalcy uh so does it have any texture do you think I, I, or does it literally taste like nothing i don't know yeah okay so yeah they eat their tasteless food and then they drop the leftovers in the box out in the uh, Yeah, they, the they, they put the box of trash at the curb. So we get the idea that the trash is picked up and new supplies are delivered every day. But here's what they do. They sit in these lawn chairs and they watch and wait for this to happen. And they got a pickaxe in their hands. And they tell us, like, yeah, we're waiting for them so we can bash their brains in whoever they are. Right. And um, But it doesn't work because every time they do this, like, they miss the transaction. Mm. Which, how does that happen? Because you literally have nothing else to do. Right. So Maybe they turn their head and yeah. then it's gone. Uh, so yeah, the kid meanwhile is just sitting there staring at them. Uh, and yeah, so Gemma ends up going inside to make some coffee. Yeah, Tom, why bother? Because it doesn't right. taste like anything. Right. I mean, maybe it keeps you awake. I don't know. Uh, Tom meanwhile is sneaking a cigarette. Apparently, you know, because he, you know, he does that little sly looking around to make sure she's not looking. Uh, and then he flicks the cigarette at the kid. It lands on the grass and burns a hole in the grass like quickly. And this is something new to Tom, clearly. Right. Because so he reacts to it instantly. We see that the grass is fake, and underneath it isn't dirt. It's kind of like, it looks like a foamy layer. Yeah, yeah, something like that. And he starts digging at it, and then underneath it, it still wasn't really dirt. It was like this foam, kind of clay, right, right. chunky something. And he quickly becomes obsessed with the ground. And in the process, Gemma comes back outside, realizes that the box is gone, but nobody saw it come. Nobody saw and uh, that nobody saw anybody come to get it. Right, the box just kind of disappeared. Right. Uh, Gemma wants Tom to stop digging, but Tom begs her to keep to let her keep let him keep doing it because it's something that he can do. Yeah, and this feels very familiar. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, very much like Rom and Tabitha and Jim digging a hole. Yeah, to see it, where it's, it feels like goes. the same thing where mm -hmm. you know we've got this unexplained obsession mm -hmm. that this becomes all he can think about and all he can do is dig this hole right 
Uh, and he goes, he does this all day. He thinks it might lead to somewhere. And later we see, a, you know, a night in the bed. Uh, Gemma suggests Australia or even hell. And Tom says, we're already in hell. And then he goes off and takes a shower. After the shower, Jam and Tom make love while the kid watches, mm -hmm. which is super creepy in itself. Uh, they start their daily routine of brushing their teeth, eating. Tom goes out to dig his hole. And uh, Tom at night, he's digging his hole, and then he joins his wife in the car. And they admire the smell of the car, which is a real smell. Yeah. We, we get the, the idea that this environment is just kind of sterile. Yeah. The environment's very artificial. There's nothing real or earthly here. Mm-hmm. Uh, they accidentally turn on the car, and a song plays, which makes them happy. Uh, did you recognize the song at all? Um, I didn't take note of what the song okay. was. But they end up dancing in front yeah, of the cars. So, so they realize yeah. that the battery still works, so they, they have music playing mm -hmm. on, I think it was a tape deck they had. Right, that they, okay. That they were listening to, you know, when they arrived. Um, because they don't have a signal to get right, a radio. Right, right. Unless, like, the place itself was providing a signal for this radio station. Yeah, right. I'm pretty sure it's, it's whatever they were listening to when they were driving in. Mm. And they turn the headlights on and they start dancing in the street. And the boy joins in. Right. And they're all, they're like, they're a happy family. They're dancing. They're having fun for the first time. Right. Right. And forever. And then, uh, the kid accidentally knocks Tom over and he hits his head. Yeah, he gets on, hurt. Yeah, like, real bad. On, that's, he could have died from that easily. He, because he hits his head on the on, pavement. On the curb. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, so he gets angry. He ends up throwing the kid yeah, up. He against... literally yeah. picks him up and throws him down on the ground. And that's because to him, this is not a kid. Right. He, they've already established that this is some evil creature who right. is somehow involved in their imprisonment. Right. So Tom ends up running off. Uh, but Gemma ends up staying behind. To make sure the kid is yeah, okay. Yeah, she's got some motherly instincts kicking right. in. So she, even though she knows, like, this isn't just a kid, she still wants to take care of him. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, she's a teacher. Now, are they commenting on parenting here? Are they saying that uh, put, maternal instincts are much more powerful than maternal instincts? Or paternal, rather? I mean, they could be. You think this is a comment about, like, uh, you know, men's role in you know, raising the kid, that they're less in, uh, less involved, less connected, less invested. It, it could be. I mean, even as far as, you know, we get the message that these creatures think so. Right. These creatures say it's the mother's job to raise the child. Right, right. So you don't think it's, you think it's the creators uh, making that comment or? Uh... I think it's one of the things that they want you to think about. Okay. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of subcontext here mm -hmm. throughout this whole story. And I actually um, read an interview that uh, Finnegan had done okay. about the story and, um, you know, how everything is open interpretation right. in the story and what their intents were weren't necessarily anything that the audience took away from it. Right, of course. Um, but yeah, they, you know, basically the concept here is that these creatures are giving the people what they think people want. Okay. Like, they're trying to make a comfortable environment for the people. Right. Similar to how we might make a comfortable zoo exhibit for animals. Right. Here's everything we think they want, right? Mm -hmm. Um, We got this nice house. We're giving you a baby. Like, you're being provided for. Mm -hmm. But it's not what you want. <laughs> Something gets lost in translation, right. basically, for them. Exactly. And much like we would for, like, an animal in a zoo. Yeah. We probably don't exactly provide for them. Of course we don't. Yeah. Like, if you ever go to the, to a zoo, it's really kind of depressing. Right. Seeing these animals in these environments. And, um, I mean, I didn't, I, I don't think I actually said this at the top, but the word vivarium. Oh, yes, yes. No, you, um, you didn't get into that. Yeah, vivarium itself, like what this movie is, is named in, in Latin, it literally means place of life. And it's used to describe an area, and this is directly from Wikipedia, it's used to describe an area usually enclosed for keeping and raising animals or plants for observation or research. Okay. So our couple here is what's being contained mm -hmm. and researched. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So not only are they making, you know, forcing this family to raise this kid that is not their own, much like the cuckoo bird. Right. But they're also doing research and examining these two. Right. And, you know, you get the idea that with all this mimicking, that the, the goal here is that these creatures are trying to be more human. They're okay. trying to understand how to 
appear to be human. Right. And right. pick up characteristics from these people and So maybe the Martin uh, you know eventually gets better at imitating humans to the point where he's less weird. Right. And more easily able to trap in a new couple. Right. Hmm. That's interesting. Uh, okay, so basically Gemma tends to the kid, uh, puts puts the kid to bed, basically says, hey, sometimes adults want a long time. We can't be with you all the time. Kid doesn't really seem to react to this, just looks confused. Um, and then he, she says, good night. She closes the door, but before she does, the kid is like, Good night, mother. And Gemma is still, even though she's you know get, gotten some instincts here yeah. to take care of this kid, she's still like, I'm not your fucking mother. Right. Um, she goes to see Tom, who's in bed already, and she kisses him. He says sorry, and I wasn't sure if she if he was apologizing for what he did to the kid, or if he was apologizing for not engaging in uh, physical activity. That's how at this I time. took it. The okay. latter. Yeah, he was gotcha. like, nope, sorry, not interested. <laughs> right. Uh, so the next morning, the kid comes in screaming. I would have murdered this kid by now. Uh, <laughs> though, I think that maybe if you raise a kid that's on a spectrum, you might have to deal with some of these issues. So maybe murder is not such a good idea if a kid behaves this way. Yeah. Well, I think this is actually, they, they were woken during the night. Uh, were they? This is where the kid's watching TV. Oh, yeah, okay. And that's notable because the TV is not playing television. No, the it's TV playing is this playing weird pattern. Black and white patterns and weird, like, subliminal messaging type mm -hmm. stuff that the kid's obsessed with. And I think this is the second time that we've seen him watching this TV. And this time it's so loud that they, the, parent, the, the parents, the couple, can't sleep. Right. And he's just insistent on watching this television and it's creeping them out. So, yeah, Gemma tries to take the remote from him. Uh, and the kid is basically like resisting. Eventually, gets the remote back, turns the TV back on. And Gemma turns to Tom and is like, "I don't know what to do." And Tom's like, "I don't give a shit." Yeah, <laughs> that's basically the vibe he gives off. And he just goes to bed. And she says, "Whatever." And the kid basically imitates Gemma at this point, saying, "Whatever," yeah. as he will do later. In the and movie. um, you know, we keep seeing their daily routine throughout right. this. Like mm -hmm. they get up, they brush their teeth, they have breakfast. And you can just kind of tell as the scenes go on and the days go on that the whole dynamic is just kind of devolving. Yeah. Uh, Gemma and Tom are growing further and further apart. They're both losing it at this mm -hmm. point, but in really opposite directions. Right. Like, she's just kind of losing her mind and she knows it. She can't handle this. He's getting more and more violent and physical. <laughs> yeah. Then they have this conversation about the boy and... Uh, he's done. He takes the kid and locks him in the car. Yes. Uh, he, he throws the bowl of cereal against the wall uh, when the kid is, you know, screaming yeah, for the Yeah, the kid's constantly time. just literally screaming. And it's not right. it's not a human scream. Right, right. It's this really creepy scream, which uh, at the beginning when we saw the cuckoo bird, it did this weird opening its mouth screaming thing. And it was kind of very similar to that. Okay. It's what this child does. Mm -hmm. um, and also it's constantly doing this weird mocking thing. So those are, it's like between those two things, the screaming and the mocking it's just super creepy. Mm -hmm. Now, bringing it back to the cuckoo bird for yeah. a moment, the bird doesn't realize that the bird that it's taking care of is not uh, its own. I don't know. It doesn't recognize the fact that the bird is doesn't look like it or doesn't look I like... I don't know. Maybe it, you know, it's lost its own kids at this point, so it just... So might as well just take care of this one? Yeah. That's really depressing and sad. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, moving back. <laughs> um, yeah, so she uh, ends up like... Uh, you know, objecting to Tom's move to lock the kid in the car. And Tom says, you're not going to play with it. You're not going to feed it. You're not going to help this Yeah, thing. you're going to let it die. Yeah, you're not going to keep mothering it. It's it. not a child. Right. It's not a he, it's an yeah. it. We have that conversation here. And, um, yeah, he his plan is we're going to let it die because either it's going to die and then maybe we can leave or they're going to come take it if they right. don't want it to die if they don't want it to die they're gonna come take it so it's not our responsibility right but Gemma can't handle this she eventually ends up you know taking the keys back from Tom and going to rescue the child yeah. and at this point she is now ready to mother the child mm -hmm. like there's been a complete change in dynamics here and uh Tom just keep digging his hole and he's yelling at the hole he's every like, day yeah and Gemma meanwhile is acting like a mother 
Yeah, and the hole's as deepest as ladder now. His ladder's right. all the way inside mm -hmm. the hole. He can't go any deeper without getting stuck. And he basically resorts to sleeping in the hole. He's sleeping in the hole. Um, he, he hears something in the ground, yeah. or he thinks he does. Um, Gemma actually spends a night cuddled up with the boy. Right. Like, she's all in on taking care of him now. Mm -hmm. And then we see the breakfast scene. Every time we've seen the breakfast scene before, there's three of them sit around the table. We now see Tom eating breakfast alone. There was actually a very nice shot at one point uh, where the camera was further back and it like highlighted the distance between like uh, Gemma and Tom. I, I don't remember when that happened exactly, but uh, it was a really cool, nice little shot. Uh, so this is, you know, very a well-directed film. Yeah. Just kind of, you know, not always the most enjoyable thing in the world. Um, um, so yeah, he's eating breakfast alone. Yeah. And Gemma and the boy are outside laying in the lawn, like having a picnic yeah. <laughs> for their breakfast. Uh, admiring the cloud-shaped clouds, yeah. as she said. What's that sh cloud shape like? A cloud? What's that cloud shape like? Right. A cloud. And, you know, she finds this very weird mm -hmm. that all the clouds are shaped like clouds. Right. And she's really, like, expressing um, how fake this place is. Mm -hmm. And guess what? We are not anywhere we should be. Right. We are not in a natural environment. Mm -hmm. And she says the kid is a mystery that she wants to figure out. And they end up whooping like a dog to the clouds yeah, or whatever. Yeah, she, she howls to the clouds. It was a really weird scene. I mean, you know, she's a kindergartner teacher and she was you know, having her kids <laughs> pretend to be trees earlier. So this tracks with her behavior. Uh, but one morning, Gemma finds the kid is missing. Tom in the hole couldn't care less. Uh, but she ends up searching the neighborhood, only to find the kid back at home, holding a book written in some language that she doesn't understand. Yeah, it was full of weird symbols and patterns that kind of represented the stuff he was watching on TV. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like a textbook. Yeah. Right? There's, like, diagrams in it of, like, human anatomy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we get the kind of idea that the kid went to school. <laughs> right. Basically. He went to school and got a book. Mm -hmm. And he's being taught things. Right. That she doesn't know anything about. And this is new, so it's... A clue it's a hint it's right. a lead mm -hmm. um she she grills him well where were you who did you meet and he says he's not allowed to say right but she then turns off the tv and says hey let's play a game yeah, so she uses her teaching skills to kind of you know trick this kid into talking yeah and um using his mocking skills which is something you know he loves to do and says uh pretend to be me pretend to be tom pretend to be a dog <laughs> is there anybody else you could pretend to be how about the person you met today and he obliges. He does this really weird rolling of the eyes yeah, thing. and creepy then his... monster cackling. And then, like, his, like, neck puffs out. And she's, at this point, completely terrified. And this is pretty much the end of her trying to be a mother to this child. Or being a mother to this child and enjoying it. She still takes care of the kid. But she's definitely back in I'm not your fucking mother mode. Yeah, and... So basically, this confirms that whoever he's meeting with is definitely not human. And nor is this child. Uh, well, we, I mean, they knew that. But right. but this was like in your face, like, oh, something bigger and weirder and scarier is happening. Right. Than we even thought. Mm-hmm. And by the next scene, the boy has aged again into a young man. Yes. And she's feeding him. The kid thanks her and she says, you're welcome. And the kid asks, did you mean that or are you being sarcastic? And I think she basically admits that... No, I didn't mean that. And he's, he's really curious about this. Well, then why did you say it? Is it because you're afraid? And she's like, probably, and then walks away. Uh, she ends up going to see Tom uh, upstairs, who's, like, not engaging in this he's, anymore He's, like, at all. locked himself up in the bedroom. Right. He wants to be not in the same room with this kid ever. Right. So she's bringing him his meals in the bedroom. And he looks really super weak yeah, he's looking sick. worse and worse as the film continues. Um, she has to shower him. Mm -hmm. He can't do it himself. Right. And uh, Gemma says, why didn't I let you kill him when he was young? And he answers, because you're a good person. And we didn't, I, that I saw, we didn't get an indication of how much more time has passed. Right. For this next aging, but. You'd have to imagine it was at least another couple months. Another couple months, months yeah, yeah. For him to have aged from that boy into this man. Mm-hmm. Gemma ends up trying to follow the kid. Yeah, she puts on running shoes, and um, he says to her, so we get the idea that this happens, like, every day. He says to her, you like this game, don't you? Mm. Which also reminded me of something from From. Yes, yes. Um, a line specific from that show. Mm -hmm. And um, so he leaves to go wherever he goes. 
Mm -hmm. school, I called it, wherever he goes to learn things. And we get the idea that every day she follows him, trying to find out where he's going and trying to see what is out there and what's happening and, and where can we go and whatever. And um, she fails to catch up with him. She's just stuck in this maze where every time she goes around a house, she ends up somewhere else and he, he's not there. <laughs> right. And that, actually, there was this one point where you see him walking past her like, uh, I don't know, she's over here looking for him and then he walks past her and then disappears. And yeah, it's really interesting. Kind of weird. Uh, meanwhile, Tom continues digging, looking worse and worse. He thinks he's found something, which turns out to be a body bag, and it seems to have a person in it. Yeah. He's unburied somebody. Right. And he kind of screams and freaks out about that, but then I, he doesn't tell Gemma. He doesn't bring this up again. Right. No. Uh, he, I, it's just, you know, he basically from the rest of the film, he's not in good shape. No. So, uh, at this point, Gemma's lost. Right. Um, which I was a little confused. How does that happen? If every direction I you go, you end up back at number nine. Maybe. It's the only one with a car in front of it, so it should be pretty easy to spot in this matrix of houses. I think maybe, like, in the process of trying to fall her kid, uh, she ends up in a different area of existence somehow. Like, I'm not really clear on it, but, like, yeah, I think maybe she gets caught up in following the kid to the point where he, she accidentally gets lost in some other dimension or something like a different 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 pocket universe temporarily i, I don't know I'm... so yeah she's lost and her and tom are basically calling to each other right and there's like this super fogginess happening which we didn't see before mm -hmm. and um eventually she finds her way back to the house so they're yep. together again and they realize they've been locked out of the house yes so the man now the boy who is now a man has locked them out of the house he's watching television mm. and refuses to let them in and uh tom at this point is in really bad shape yeah they end up sleeping in the car the next morning the boy exits and Gemma begs for help and all he does is look at tom and says Maybe it's time for him to be released. Yeah, which like, still seems like maybe that's a good thing. Right. Yay, maybe we did what we needed to do and we're going to get to go now. Not so much. Uh, Jenna continues to sit with Tom outside as he continues to get sicker. And they reminisce yes. about the wind. This is where they talk about, do you remember wind? Yes. And I'm reminded that at the beginning of the movie, she was pretending to be wind with mm -hmm. the trees and all yes, that with yes. her kids. And then they reminisce about um, the time they met and their first date and how they started dating. Mm -hmm. And we hear a little bit of their backstory. And then he dies. In her arms. Yes. Uh, the kid returns with a body bag, which doesn't help Gemma with her grief yeah, at all. And she realizes at this moment that, what he meant right. when he said maybe it's time to release him. Right, yes. That Release means death. That he knew that he was dying. He let him die. Mm -hmm. And he shows no concern for it. I mean, I... I I can't really blame the kid, but because it's not like Tom ever showed him any kind of affection. But later he shows the same kind of uh, lack of concern for Gemma, too. Yeah. So they put him in a, this body bag. They, uh, like, vacuum seal him in it. Mm -hmm. And then drop him in the hole that he dug. Tom was literally digging his own yeah. grave. Drop, drop him in the hole, uh, you know, where that other body he found was. Yep. And, um, yeah, so... Another parallel this this shows me yes. about uh, to from is yep, you know yep. the the whole leading to you know Tom's death. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, so the next morning, Gemma waits for the kid in the car and then tries to kill him with a pickaxe. At this point, he acts like a creature and not a human anymore. Yeah, he's he's done being their child. He's mm. he's whatever he's matured into whatever he's gonna be. Right. And he doesn't have a use for these people anymore. Right. So they let Tom die. And uh, Gemma knows that her time is is limited here, and so she's trying. She wants to kill him, so she's waiting with the pickaxe, and she attacks him. She actually hits him like yep. in the eye, and he responds very like creature monster bug like. Yeah, and yeah. makes these weird he ends noises, up crawling around, and then he and pulls he, up the sidewalk he like picks a up rug. The ground, right? Yeah, and like scurries underneath it. And this mm. is one of those scenes that I was like, I have a real hard time describing this. Right, right. You kind of just gotta watch it. Um, huh. she sticks the pickaxe in the hole in the ground. Yep, so that to, she, to hold, she too can... To hold this thing open. And basically she crawls into it after him, and she's in another dimension. Mm-hmm. Uh, she ends up in this red-hued universe where she sees another boy. A little of, boy watching fake TV. 
and a woman is crying at the yeah, table. Yeah, sitting at the table crying. So this is like parallel to early on in their story when right. the boy is young. And then she like sinks into the floor like it's quicksand and falls through that into a green tinted room. Not puke green like our universe, but right. the whole screen has a green tint to it. And uh, she sees a couple having sex while a boy claps. That's not awkward at all. And then she gets pulled through the wall where she sees a man who ends up uh, having she, she, killed himself. She's in a blue blue tinted place right. now. She's in a shower. And yeah, there's a dead man in the tub. Yeah, uh, so he clearly didn't uh, stand up to the uh, pressure of this environment, yeah. that's for sure. And then she like falls backwards from the tub and uh, tumbles down the stairs and she's back into her into her environment now mm -hmm. where the, the lighting has gone back to regular lighting and she's back home and these dimensions basically like just ejected her and sent her back where she belongs. <laughs> uh, she ends up going outside and crying and collapsing on the ground. Yeah, and she realizes like there is no escape. Mm -hmm. And then we see the, the boy, the man, um, he's fixing up the house, he's painting over that that thing on the wall where they were keeping track of his height. And we're hearing a conversation between him and Gemma during this. And she says, what am I? Right. What am I in this? Mm -hmm. And she goes, you're a mother. Right. Someone who prepares her son for the world. And then she asks, what does a mother do then? And he says, you die. She dies. Yeah. yeah. And at this point, we see what's happening during this conversation is that he is zipping her into one of those body bags. Wow, she's still She's alive. not dead. Yeah, she's still living. Uh, but he zips her into the body bag, vacuum seals it, and then thumps her down the stairs. Right. Before that, though, <laughs> okay. He, he, she goes to say something, and he opens oh, the yeah. bag back up, and he's like, uh, pardon? And she says, I'm not your fucking mother. And then... He says, whatever, and yeah. zips up Which the was one of the mockings of her right, saying right. whatever. That yep, was yep. one of the things he learned from her. And, uh, yeah, so he thuds her down the stairs. So I'm not sure at what point during this she actually died. <laughs> but by the time we get uh, to the bottom, she's dead, and he throws her in the hole with mm -hmm. Tom. And then buries them in the hole, fills the hole in with all the dirt that, you know, Tom left all around it over the last few months. And immediately once the hole's filled in, the grass just regrows over it. Super creepy. Super, super creepy. And so, you know, we get the idea that this is exactly what's happened in previous iterations. This is mm. how that other body ended up there. Right. That um, somehow they keep digging these holes mm -hmm. and people, you know, they get buried there. Yep. And it's, it's, it's bad. It's, it's, it's sad. It's creepy. Uh, so he ends up. Getting in the car. Yeah, their car. He has gas. He has a gas can now. Oh, yeah, yeah. So he put gas in their car. Now, I also thought that when they were dancing and when Tom got hurt, like, the battery died because the lights and music kicked off. But at this point, the, the battery's fine. Mm -hmm. So that was supernatural forces that, you know, either stopped the car or now made it work or one right, way or the other. Right, right. Um, so, yeah, the car's fine, and, and this man just drives off. Mm-hmm. And then ends up back at the office. Yeah, back at the office, at the real estate office. Goes to see Martin. Who's looking not too good Martin's at this point. Martin's a very old man now. Because yes. we can see the aging of this species. They uh, still progress quite quickly mm -hmm. throughout their life. And Martin's a very old man. And um, he hands this man his Martin name tag. Which means he is now Martin. So our boy has grown up and is Martin, the new Martin. Mm -hmm. The old man dies. You know what would have been a nice touch if they had had been the same actor basically you know what the first time i watched this yeah i thought that's what they did it's not like i thought but... that he had aged up again and had literally become the martin actor at the beginning mm -hmm. and when i watched it this time i was like oh wait that didn't happen but that <laughs> happened in my head i think how i remembered it <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah he uh martin the original one dies and he and basically ends up getting out a uh, yeah, body bag new and... martin takes out a body bag that's sitting in the filing cabinet uh, vacuum seals him in it except when he vacuum seals him he kind of like collapses into a nothingness oh. where Martin's able to literally fold the body bag back up mm -hmm. the size that it originally was mm -hmm. stick it back in the drawer interesting and then like we heard this noise like it sounded like it was just falling into some oblivion in the drawer <laughs> um, oh not before before doing that he stapled a receipt on it 
uh-huh. onto the bag. It was receipt number 8999. So maybe that's an idea of how many times they've we've done, done this. They've done this a lot. Yeah. And their seats labeled, I was able to read Martin and Yonder. Oh, okay. So we get the impression that um, besides there being multiple dimensions and multiple iterations of this happening, there's perhaps all different uh, developments as well, you know? <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I fold him up, put him in the filing cabinet, and uh, he sits down at the desk, and he is now the real estate agent. And once you know it, a new hapless couple a happens A new couple in. walks through the door and starts looking at the model homes. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is where the movie ends. Yes. So that was the feel bad movie of 2019. <laughs> a lot of similarities in story um, mm. where, you know, we've got people getting trapped and they can't mm. escape. Um, one big difference is they make it really clear this is a very in, uh, unnatural environment. Mm -hmm. um, whereas in From, they stress the point like, well, it is natural. It's just not what you're used to. Right. So that's kind of a stark difference there. Mm -hmm. And it, they leave this up to interpretation. And, mm -hmm. The whole thing, I'm just kind of like, I don't know what I'm supposed to think. Like, where were they? Right. Like, how how did that work? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what was this other species? Right. Yeah, we don't get any answers to that question yeah. whatsoever. And what really is their end game? Right. Because after Martin set them up in this home and gave them a baby, like, he just went back and sat at the desk until he died? I guess. Um, I feel like I'm missing a chapter of what they're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Like in one part, you kind of feel like, oh, maybe they want to like, you know, infiltrate Earth and take over humans. And right. I mean, are they aliens? Um, you kind of get that idea. There's a, in that book, you definitely see at one point, like a little drawing that looks like a little flying saucer. Yeah. Um, but... Now in that interview that I mentioned that the director did, um, mm -hmm. He explicitly said, yeah, we didn't intend them to be aliens. I mean, no. he said, I guess it depends on what your definition of an alien is, but they're just another species. So they're another species that exist on this planet, I mean, basically. Yeah. So they're kind of like uh, an invasive species, kind of like the cuckoo bird. Exactly. Which is... Um, that they're just kind of living among humans. Mm -hmm. But they definitely have extra terrestrial powers, as in things that don't feel like they should be of this Earth. Right. I mean, maybe it's just because this is something that we don't know about. We don't know about, yeah. And um, you get the idea that this is happening a lot. Right. You know, not only is it happening simultaneously in different dimensions, but it's, yeah, there seems mm. to be other developments and other things happen. I don't know. I'm, I'm left confused. Like, what, what what's supposed to be the takeaway? Um, so I read somewhere, and I don't quite know where exactly, that basically Tom and Gemma not only end up the parents taking, you know, care of this child that is not from their species, but also they end up the dead baby birds at the same time. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that was an interesting take. I don't remember where I read that from exactly, but, yeah, I've read all sorts of takes on yeah. this. And yeah. also, I think it was in that same interview, um... Something about specifically the type of okay, and I I didn't write this down. So, but the type of bird that the cuckoo was infiltrating was uh, a wobbler, something wobbler. See, I, okay. If I don't have something written down, I'm just kind of talking out on my butt. I don't know what I'm saying, <laughs> but it's a black and white bird. Okay. And that Martin and the boy represent that because they're only wearing black and white, and the TV's in black and white. Okay. So they're also representing like this the. Uh, the victim bird, oh, okay. not just that they're the cuckoo bird. Gotcha. But they're also like they're the victim. They're the ones who like aren't in control, even though they are. Right. If that makes sense. Like, yeah. Like the boy. So the boy th th needs the people to teach him how to be mm -hmm. right. So it's this symbiotic relationship, right, between two species that. Well, I mean, need like... each other in this in this setting i get the sense that you know he needs to be brought up so that he could learn how to manipulate humans to get them to come and do this in the first place right but why so he, he could be, yeah. <laughs> but if your whole sense of being is to do this then what what are you doing yeah i don't know just living i guess it's it's all odd and where are these babies coming from yeah i don't know i mean i i get the feeling they're all males right but it's not a story of like let's use the humans to reproduce mm -hmm. they're just using them to raise their babies are they trying to get to a point where they're capable of raising their own young? Like, why aren't they at this point if they've mm -hmm. done this 9,000 times? Right. 
And what, you know, where else do these creatures exist? Right. Like, they can't just exist in this office. Yeah, this is just... End with cycle. You know, this is just some observation and research. But, mm-hmm. but how is this implemented into the greater world? Right. Um, I feel like there's room for a sequel here. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> to give us more of, like, outside of this environment and this story, what is this? Right. Yeah. That would be good to good to see for sure. Uh, we have any other thoughts about this um, movie? No, I think we can wrap it up. All right. Uh, Stacy can be reached at? I can be reached on Twitter or X, as it's apparently now called. Yes. Uh, yes. And... Twitter doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> And Instagram and threads at TVN Coupon Talk. All right. We'd like to hear from you. Did you like this podcast? What did you think of this movie? Uh, so on and so forth. If there's something you'd like to see us cover, uh, feel free to give us a suggestion. We'll take it under advisement, of course. Uh, if you like, if you like this video and want to support the channel, there are a number of ways to do so. You can follow me on Twitter or X at Corman Productions. You can uh, join my Corman Productions Facebook page. You can buy something from the Corman Productions store on Zazzle. You can buy me a coffee, which is a new way to support content creators such as, such as ourselves. And of course, you can like, share, and comment on this video as well as subscribing to our channel. This is Dave from Corman, Dave and Stacy from Corman Productions signing off.